Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on Washington Irving and Rip Van Winkle. Uh, the image you see right now is of course from Washington Irving's other famous story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So let's talk about Washington Irving. Uh, he was born in 1783 and died 1859, so again among our authors he had, he had a rather longer life, um, almost uh, 80 years as we can see. As an author, Washington Irving is most influential in both horror and humor, and when you look at his work and where it shows up, you see his work showing up often in a lot of horror anthologies, such as um, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and The Adventure of the German Student are probably two of his more popular horror stories, and his humor stories, again, uh, in this case, you know, we see Rip Van Winkle and we see a couple of other short stories regularly show up in humor anthologies. So th those are his kind of legacies. Those are the, you know, he's one that people look back to for the or early origins of these two genres. What people don't often know about Washington Irving is that he wrote biographies. And two of his most famous biographies are Christopher Columbus and Muhammad, uh, that is the prophet of the Islam religion. And most interesting about Christopher Columbus's biography, uh, about the biography that Irving writes for Christopher Columbus, is this is where we get the myth that Columbus was sailing across the world and everybody at the time thought the world was flat. This is something that Washington Irving wrote in the 1800s. So he wrote it, he wrote it over 300 years from when Columbus actually sailed across the ocean. And what he was writing was, in some ways, he was creating the myth of America, is what I would say. He looked at what Columbus did, and he started to research Columbus's life, and he found out that there was this small cult of people at the time who believed the world was flat. The fact is, the majority of the people in Europe understood that the world was round. But he found this cult of people that found the world or believed the world to be flat, and he used that as part of his story, saying, you know, Columbus, you know, was living in a world in which people thought it was flat, and therefore he was defying um, the common sense, and he found America. And by doing that, by saying Columbus found America, and you know, flew in the face of, of everything else. It, cre it made Columbus sound much more braver than he just wasn't sure how far uh, Asia was from Europe if he sailed east. And so it's a it's very interesting change and it contributes to a lot of our identity in within the culture about our rugged individualism and our and our desire to forge out, um, you know, to forge out on our own, and that you know Columbus was doing this against what the the common people, you know, what the common wisdom was at the time. Well, Columbus wasn't, um, and I think that's it's a very interesting way in which Irving has influenced our culture and our, the ways the things we believe about our culture. Uh, not many of his stories are set in America. In fact, the two ones that we read are probably the, the two most popular and largely the two that are set in America. And I think that says something that even though we consider him an American author, he doesn't really talk much about um, about America, although the two stories that he writes are clearly of American, dis uh, or clearly embody um, American ideas. His worldwide influence, he's read throughout the world. Um, he's read in Europe a lot, uh, and he's read it in different parts just because of his style was uh, somewhat, somewhat fresh for the time. So let's take a, a look at Rip Van Winkle. As a short story, there are some interesting things that Irving does with this story. First, it was published in the, the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon. Um, Jeffrey Crayon is not a real person. Sketchbook, that's just another way of saying anthology or collection of works. The story presents itself as a recovered text. And this is very fascinating because this is used uh, in a lot of different 
storytelling. In fact, it's used all the way up to the present. If you've ever seen The Blair Witch Project or even Cloverfield, both of those films are recovered text. And what I mean by that is somebody stumbles upon or finds this account that occurred, right? And that's what Rip Van Winkle is. If, if, you, remember, if you go and read the beginning, it sets it up as, oh, this was, you know, this was found among the works of uh, Dietrich Knickerbocker. And, you know, the truthfulness of the story we will never know, blah, blah, blah. And that's the other piece of this, is that um, Irving has this this fake historian, this faux historian named Dietrich Knickerbocker, who's supposed to tell the Dutch history of New York. For, because for those that don't know, New York for, a ver for much of the 1600s was under the Dutch possession. It wasn't an English colony, it was a Dutch possession. Uh, and so there's a strong Dutch influence in many parts of in many parts of New York and many places are named with Dutch names. So Irving has this this fake historian, Dietrich Knickerbocker, um, telling all these different types of histories. Alright, so what I want to recognize is the ways in which Irving sets up the the story to parallel in many ways the colonial experience so let's read we're going to look at a couple early passages and then allow you to go off and read it on your own and kind of take that with you all right who so whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill, the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachia family and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains, and they are regarded by all the good wives far and near as perfect barometers. What I want to recognize here is that if you understand that this story is just as much about the American Revolution as it is about the character Rip Van Winkle, this sentence sets up a very, th this paragraph sets up a very, very interesting imagery, right? He talks about the cat the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachia family, right? So there's this offshoot. Right, their dismembered branch. And if we look at the American colonies, you can see the American colonies as a dismembered branch of the of the English Empire. And again, in the in the 1700s, the English Empire is is fairly is fairly substantial, fairly big. So the the American colonies are dismembered branch, are seen to the west of the river, right? So they're west of the river. Well, what river do we know that's between the Americas and the, uh, between the American colonies and England, well, you could say the, the Atlantic Ocean is a river, right? It is, uh, is that we are, the colonies are west of and the, the Atlantic as well as, Europe, uh, as well as England. Swelling up to a noble height and lording over the surrounding country, right? And so this is this is an implication that, of course, you know, the power, the prestige, the importance of those colonies is swelling up and, and having this impact on the surrounding country. And then every change of season, every change of weather, every indeed every hour produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains. That is, these colonies are being are constantly changing and, and developing and are almost magical, right? So, if you can understand Van Winkle, at Rip Van Winkle, the story as this discussion between about what's going on in the Americas, this description fits that really well. And he goes on, when the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, which in the last rays of the settling sun will glow and light up like a crown of glory. So that idea of a crown of glory, that these are, I mean, he really describes this this place, the, Cat, the Catskills Mountain, as a place of magic, as a place of prestige, right? If we look at this description, we've got words like crown of glory, uh, we have bold outlines, right? We have these majestic colors of purple, you know, they're clothed in blue and purple. Uh, there really is this emphasis on the prestige and the power and the potential of this land. 
And he also makes the world, he makes this world sound almost magical. He makes this world sound almost, you know, the, the, the potential and the power that's there is, is just burgeoning, right? So at the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have described the light smoke curling up from a village whose, sing, whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees, just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape. So this this very descriptive opening really does paint this picture of a magical place that's burgeoning with power and possibility. And then we have the introduction of Rip. And Rip's a very interesting character. I have observed, and that's a good question to think about, is who is the I in this story? Is it Dietrich Knickerbocker? And if so, you know, what's his role in this as observer? I have observed that he was a simple, good-natured man. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor and an obedient, henpecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. For those men are most apt to be obsequious and consolating abroad who are under the discipline of shrews at home. Okay, before I move on, I just want to just wanna look at this. He was a simple, good-natured man, um, a kind neighbor, and obedient, henpecked husband. And again, if you think about the ways in which the, America, the, the American colonies are connected to or have to deal with King George III or represent King George III as this, you know, as this very the significant tyrant well you know what's the parallel to a tyrant it is of course a a shrew of a wife so what you can see here is that Irving Irving has flipped he has turned the Americas into Rip and he has turned Henry I'm sorry King George into a shrew Right? Indeed, the later criticism might be owing to the meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. Right? So he's very popular, he's kind, he, he's obedient. Um, and what we see is his one act of disobedience when he flees the house and runs away uh, is really the start of something bigger. It's, it's the start of some bigger change. Their tempers, are, you know, their tempers doubtless are rendered and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation, and a curtain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long suffering. So he's really painting Rip Van Winkle's wife, Ma the, the dame Van Winkle, as a very, very unappealing woman, um, who I would argue is actually supposed to be King, uh, King George in disguise. The ways in which she lords over him the ways in which you know she keeps him from being successful the great error in rip's composition was an insufferable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor it cannot be from the want of assidu assiduity or perseverance for he would sit on a wet rock with a rod as long and heavy as a tartar's lance and fish all day without a murmur the women of the village, too, used to employ him to run their errands and to do such little odd jobs as their less obliging husbands would not do for them. In a word, Rip was ready to attend anybody's business but his own, but as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order, it was impossible. So he's able to help all these other people, his neighbors, his community, he's great, but when it comes to him being productive he cannot be and the responsibility or, or a lot of that seems to fall on the ways in which his wife harps upon him and again if we look at his wife as King George we can say well the the American colonies are limited and restricted and not able to do anything because you know this person is lording over them and, and really preventing them from success right that in order it, that they cannot keep their their family and their farm in order because of the ways in which matter in which Dame Van Rankle just utterly destroys their potential. If left to himself, he would have whistled away in perfect contentment, whistled life away in perfect contentment, but his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing his family. Morning, noon, and night, her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was, was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of the kind, and that, by frequent use, had gone into, grown into a habit. He shrugged his shoulders. 
shook his head, cast up his eyes, but said nothing. This, however, only provoked a, provoked a fresh volley from his wife, so that he was fain to draw off his forces and take to outside of the house the only side which in truth belongs to a henpecked husband. So again, the ways in which Dame Van Winkle just utterly attacks and devalues Rip sends him fleeing outside the husband and to the point in which he does not even, you know, have his own house, right? That that last line there, the take to the take out take to the outside of the house, the only side which in truth belongs to the henpecked husband. So the henpecked husband only belongs outside of the house, does not belong inside his own house. So these are some of the you know this is some of the contrast that that. Washington Irving is setting up very early in the story so that when Rip goes off and he sleeps 20 years and he comes back and we, he sees what happens, it creates a very, very, there's a lot of ways in which you can now connect this about what the new world is all about. All right, that's it for this mini lecture. Thank you for listening and see you in the next one.